Welcome to Return on India, a deep dive series covering one of the most populous and promising economies in the world. Through conversations with central figures in Indian business, Return on India will unpack the details that matter for investors and operators. We will examine the unique cultural dynamics behind emerging demographic trends, and we will drill into key sectors by talking to the business leaders driving change. We plan to investigate the past, present, and future as we explore India's investment case. To find more episodes, transcripts, and a library of content to continue your learning, visit joincolossus.com. All opinions expressed by hosts and podcast guests are solely their own opinions. Hosts, podcast guests, their employers or affiliates may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. My guest today is Anand Chandrasekhar, General Partner at General Catalyst. While India has become a popular investment hub in recent years, it wasn't the case just shy of a decade ago. Even more rare were investors that spent equivalent amounts of time in India and the Bay Area. Anand has a unique perspective, and it's why I wanted to bring him on to return on India. He's operated and invested in both the East and the West. He spent time at formidable players in both countries, such as Facebook, Yahoo, Bharti Airtel, and Snapdeal, and coalesced those perspectives into over 80 investments prior to joining GC. For that, Anand is widely recognized as one of the top seed angel investors in the Indian ecosystem. Today, we went wide and deep. We unpacked the different phases of India's growth, the challenges of building in India, and how India compares to the U.S. ecosystem with some insight for the outlook ahead. Please enjoy my conversation with Anand Chandrasekhar. Anand, welcome. Thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for having me, Romin. It's great to be here. We're going to go deep into what's going on in the Indian startup ecosystem. And for our listeners, your perspective especially is unique. You've spent time both in San Francisco and India as an investor, as an operator. And today, you really spend all your time thinking about this east-west divide at General Catalyst. So I want to kick off our conversation with the framework you put together. I think it's really helpful to understand the different phases of India's growth. You've called it the cowboy phase, the geo phase, and the growth phase. So maybe explain to us what those are and then where the ecosystems are today. I would start this in terms of dating it from the 2015 timeframe. This also coincides with when I personally made a career move to go to India and build products over there. And I really was living firsthand this cowboy phase where 94% of India's telco subscribers are on a prepaid connection. So they don't get a bill at the end of the month and they're not reliably connected. The thing that hit me was I was building for Android. So all my iPhone development skills and getting it featured by Apple the first day of your launch, that whole thing had to be unlearned. But the even more shocking aha moment for me is that 94% of my customers are not reliably connected every single day. So the cowboy phase, you had no product pull and you had no distribution push. A lot of the founder skill set and operating skill set was doing whatever it took to both get some product pull as well as some distribution push. So you didn't get a lot of credit as a founder for the creativity of building a unique service that people wanted, because regardless of how cool it was, you had to do all the cowboy hustling to get both product adopted as well as distribution. Flash forward to 2016 or so when Geo came into the scene, built by Reliance, one of India's largest conglomerates. They both brought the price down significantly, but also made the network extremely focused on data. So for many people who don't know, their entire network is built on VoLT or voice over LTE, which is moving voice through a data network, as opposed to most networks that are designed to move data through primarily a voice network. By doing that, they were able to offer this emphasis on data pricing and data can be consumed in almost infinite gulps as opposed to small sips earlier. And this actually completely eliminated this 94% of people not being reliably connected. And I believe even today, the price per gigabyte is lowest in India compared to many of the growing internet economies. This phase removed the distribution push part of the problem. And then that got us to 2020, where like everywhere else in the world, because of physical distancing and shops being shut down and all of that, various demographics of consumers started adopting services digital first. A friend of mine told me anecdotally, 
that the number of credit or debit card applications per month was the highest in Q2 of this year compared to the history of the Indian fintech ecosystem. It's early indications that there is also some product pull in addition to distribution push. So with that, I'm actually really excited that we're in the cusp of this new phase where founders can focus a little bit more uniquely on the creativity and the unique services that they're building without having to worry about the non-leveraged hustle. The last piece of what you said, moving from the basics to creativity, is an interesting lens to use because the evolution through these phases in the Indian ecosystem has had this thematic undercurrent that's also evolved. So the rest of the world has looked at India typically as being a low-cost resource arbitrage location. And you could say that parallels with the basics of what you were just saying. But more and more, we're starting to see it as a hub for innovation for the world, which really pertains to the creative portion of what you were just saying. What you said really resonates with me because when I moved out to the Valley to go to school at Stanford, I was trying to find out what made Silicon Valley so special. And the recurring meme that I would hear was that people would build for themselves and their friends. Or in their previous job, they saw a huge technical problem and they would build business software to solve it in the hope that many other people were facing that problem as well. What has happened as a result of this creative phase or the growth phase, as we just talked about, it now creates a moment where people can start to build for themselves and really focus on that really fast iterative feedback loop. That is what drove so many consumer companies to grow really quickly in the Valley and other places in the world. But I think to your point, looking back, we have also evolved in terms of the kind of company getting built, not just the underlying dynamics. In the 80s, we had these outsourced IT providers. And obviously, they've all gone public. Some of them have also created India as a market where it's going to create these very well-run companies. So Infosys, for example, stood for incredible ethical transparency and so on, which also made them an investor darling when they went public and so on. And the founders of Infosys, you spoke with Nandan, who's probably the best example of that today. They're still seen as bastions of how to run businesses ethically and with transparency. Many people still take their cues about the how of building a business from you know, companies like Infosys and so on. But I think the other dynamic was if you were a computer science graduate from college at that time, these were the really cool companies to join if you ended up staying in India. And of course, that led to a lot of folks who said, I want to pursue a deeply technical education and I don't want to build for this customer that I will never meet. That also led to a lot of folks graduating from the IITs and other top educational institutions in India, moving to the US and other parts of the world to get these deeply technical degrees. And of course, the way that story ends is that those are the leaders that we see today running all these large companies that are now run by Indian-born executives. In parallel, around this cowboy phase that we talked about in the 2015 timeframe, there was also the X of Y companies being built in India. Flipkart was the Amazon of India. Ola was the Uber of India. And they were the first sets of internet-first companies. The problem was because they were building a very well-known product model and a business model, guess what? Amazon woke up one day and said, well, India is the biggest market of internet users. Amazon wanted to be the Amazon of India. And Uber wanted to be the Uber of India. That led to the need for a lot of capital to acquire these users. The consumers were not used to this new behavior, so you had to give away a lot of discounts to drive the adoption of the online behavior from the offline behavior and so on. And that was the second phase of the evolution in India. And then, just like what happened in the United States, a bunch of software founders who were not necessarily driving consumer adoption said, look, there's a technology problem that I'd like to solve. And not surprisingly, they had the same ideas that a lot of the counterparts in the West had had. So a lot of them initially came across like copycats, and they've evolved a lot since. So if you take Freshworks, a lot of folks see parallels between Freshworks' early products and companies like Zendesk and Salesforce in the US. But that's continued to be a kind of company that gets built out of India, where it's sometimes called India for the world. The thing that I'm really excited about, even though all of these kinds of companies will continue to be built with different growth rates and focus areas and so on, is the fourth one, I call them the native unicorn, which is there's no parallel for that kind of company globally. And they're uniquely solving an India first problem that is itself large enough to build a substantial company. And this is either in the digitization on the consumer side, or it's digitization in the B2B side, both of which are creating huge opportunities. 
in the future, they could also be global companies because they're bringing that software-driven, technology-driven digitization solution to other countries that need to be digitized as well. I think that while the outsourced IT provider company is probably in the more mature stage and probably not in high growth, the other three are all in this exciting stage of high growth still. Yeah, and I want to unpack those three archetypes, X of Y, India for the world, and native unicorns. And maybe before we jump into those three archetypes, what would probably be helpful for folks listening, especially in the West, is just understanding a little bit more how to appropriately think about India. I think in the West, there's often a homogenous perspective on how to think about India. But really, when you unpack the layers and you think about the country more appropriately, there's significant heterogeneity. And so maybe you can explain just a little bit more how we should be appropriately thinking about India. I think that'll lead into how we can talk about some of those archetypes you just laid out. Yeah, absolutely. I think the biggest thing that strikes you is over 95% of India is on Android. So literally, one company's operating system powers 95% of India's smartphones. So if you're building for iOS in India, you're addressing less than 5% of your user base. So that's a big thing that hits you when you start building for India, which is a lot of the skills that product managers and engineers are used to over here have to be unlearned. You're just building for a very different tech stack. But also on the consumer side, think of it as India is really 22 countries with a geographic border rather than one country. As you know, Romin, you could travel to different parts of India and folks wouldn't speak the same language. They have different food habits. They have different cultures. But what is kind of interesting, a colleague of mine remarked this to me and I thought was very poignant, that if India goes to the moon, for example, or if India wins the World Cup, any such softer moment. Recently, India won a bunch of gold medals in the Commonwealth Games. All of India celebrates a billion people who are all on the same page, as opposed to this polarization that's crept into the US. If someone from the US goes to Mars today, there's going to be all this scrutiny of, it's just a bunch of billionaires going to Mars. It's not an American moment because all of America doesn't dream as one anymore. Like when the Man on the Moon project happened, all of America was dreaming together. India still has the India dreams together moments, especially of national pride. One story that was quite inspiring for me was that the government actually broke a 70-year law to allow common citizens to fly the national flag from the 13th of August to the 15th of August. So it actually was a really interesting social experiment, which was overriding 70 years of known law, where you can't fly the national flag except if it's a public function. And then after 6 p.m., you're going to have to unfurl it and deal with it with certain kind of respect and dignity. And this was a really interesting way of saying, we're actually going to give a visual medium to show the nationalistic pride and patriotism. And you could literally see that I was in India on the 13th of August before I left. It was quite a sight to see where India dreams as one. But that said, the differences are still there where a lot of people are still illiterate, but coming online. So there's a lot of video first consumption where they can read and understand content, even though they can't speak it. So text content was an inhibitor for a lot of people to embrace the internet truly. So you're seeing the explosion of video first platforms in India, for example, that are used for social networking. There's many examples of those breakouts. But also it's worth calling out if you compare with Africa, for example, or LATAM, India is one sovereign territory that comes with its pros and cons, but it's not like you're dealing with 22 separate countries and 22 separate jurisdictions and so on. The visa process has become so simple to enter India if you're a U.S. citizen, for example. In fact, there's now complaints that the reverse is not true anymore. And it's harder for someone from India to apply to the U.S. visa system than the opposite, which used to be the case a few years ago. And so those are probably the big ones that I'd focus on from the outside in as you look at India as a market and as a country. Well, the framing in the inside that India still dreams as one is particularly interesting to me, especially when thinking about the role of government in advancing ecosystems and tech ecosystems. Something a lot of folks don't know in the U.S. about India is the government has actually been very progressive when it comes to technology advancement and adoption. It's something that certainly does not come to mind when folks in the West think of the interaction between private and public sector here. But that has changed because historically, the public sector in the U.S. was a great force for innovation. I've heard this phrase and this concept multiple times from founders now in India that's really resonated with me. It's this idea that startups are seen as a solution to building a great country in India. Maybe you can expand on that a little bit more because I think it frames actually quite nicely with what you were just saying about this idea that India still dreams as one. 
Last night, I was just chatting with a company that has taken audio as a platform. They have hugely growing number of subscribers. They're going to be bigger than Netflix next year in terms of subscribers. And what's exciting for me, this speaks to this native unicorn concept, is that most of the content is aspirational for Indians to get better. And the story that the founders were telling me is that someone who's a security guard will study English and become a receptionist in an office. So it's not just the IIT engineers who are aspiring to get better. It is actually the various stratas of society which have higher aspirations for themselves and their next generations. You appreciate this, that despite the social strata and even if they're middle class, Indians pay for education for themselves and their kids and also for status related, which is why marriages get so much money spent because social status in the offline world really matters. I think that you're going to see a lot of these unique models which are taking advantage of this aspirational nature of hundreds of millions of users coming online. And this might not be the same kind of aspiration that an entrepreneur might have. It's the kind of aspiration where someone in one strata of society can actually get to the next strata by having a growth mindset, as they say here, and getting better and being able to leap to the next level. The other side of this is also entrepreneurship is actually becoming a socially accepted thing. Previously, the word entrepreneurship was not in vogue in India. It used to be called like self-employed. And one of my friends who runs India's largest matrimonial sites was telling me that in 2019, this interesting leap happened where the most searched keyword on his website and app was actually entrepreneur. Previously, if you were a self-employed founder, the social capital of that was actually very low. Whereas now being an entrepreneur is cool. And the first generation of role models are all heroes for these young founders. And that social capital has started to compound as well of being a founder. If we think about the three archetypes that you had laid out, I'm curious how you think about the size of the opportunity set that sits underneath each. In my mind, outside in, I would think about them in the reverse order. So I would think that India native companies have the largest potential, then India for the world, and then X for Y. And the rationale really being that India native companies are going to be the most bottoms up products, the truest use cases, they get to the real on the ground behavior versus let's say X for Y, which is more like a Venn diagram approach to building a company. There's going to be overlap, but there's only going to be so much overlap, which naturally caps the upside. Is that how you think about it? Both for the X of Y companies, as well as companies that take well-known products in the Western ecosystem and build it at lower cost or better margins or whatever, the trade-off is the following. If you are building an X of Y company, the product market fit is actually lower because there's this proven paths to product market fit elsewhere in the world. So as an entrepreneur who's already struggling, maybe in the cowboy phase to get users and get the product adopted, you also don't want product market fit risk. So if you can take that off the table and focus on growth risks in the country, you can create something of substance. In a world where there are 700 million connected Indians and COVID has driven the equalization of great products anywhere in the world, the premium for creativity is actually higher. I actually feel like the India first or uniquely different products built in India for the world will have a bigger premium in the future for the exact reason that you said because they're able to experiment faster, they're able to have these global teams, the path to product market fit may not be as hard as it used to be before. That's the trade-off. How quickly can you get to PMF versus how much of a uniquely differentiated business can you build, which doesn't have someone who knows how to do this in 35 different countries to come and compete with you in India. The native companies are probably going to be able to operate in greenfield spaces for many more years and hopefully build a much larger business over time. And what are some of the characteristics of these types of companies, the native India unicorns? One interesting way that you can understand these companies is really getting a better understanding of the different types of starting points that they're built off of. One of the ones that you mentioned earlier was 95% of Indian consumers are on Android, obviously very different than if you're building from the West. What are some of these different types of starting points that are important to keep in mind when you're thinking about that third archetype of company? I use this principle when I think about these opportunities a lot, which is plumbing and sewage versus curtains and drapes. You don't want to be solving a curtains and drapes level problem right now if you're building a native unicorn. The largest opportunities are really in the plumbing and sewage level problem in terms of building a house. 
they are much more essential. And in India, there's still a lot of plumbing and sewage level problems. The biggest thing I look for is that essential nature of what they're solving. Within that, there are still huge contributors to GDP that offer some large opportunities. Like, for example, we're very bullish about agri-tech as one area. So agriculture contributes to 20 to 21% of India's GDP. It's very likely with all the new founders that are getting there that that could stay flat as India's GDP grows a lot or even increase, which is quite exciting. And we're very excited about companies that are building full stack solutions where they take the technology risk entirely into their own hands. So we're investors in two companies in that space. One is called Eki Foods, which is a full stack grower. They just got nominated to be the top innovator in India at the Economic Times Awards. So they're starting to get recognized in the mainstream. But these are two robotics engineers that have invented a new growing system at India costs. By doing that, they can actually go after barren lands and grow tomatoes. So tomatoes, for example, is a mainstream vegetable, but it's seasonal because of the costs during the off seasons. So by being able to grow it in barren lands all through the year, their hope is to actually bring it to mass prices and therefore stimulate mass adoption. Not exactly the first thing you think of when you think of tech investing, but it's a great example of the supply is infinite, the demand is infinite. This is a plumbing and sewage level problem. This is not a curtains and drapes problem. The other thing I was telling you about the audio market as an example, is just new consumer behaviors. So what this founder was telling me is that in India, people live in joint families and enclosed spaces with a lot of people. And if one of your family members is sleeping, you can't be watching video because that makes a dark room light. But you could be on headphones and consume a lot of original audio content. It's unique consumer behaviors that drive very deep subscription type adoption. And then the other two things that I'm very bullish about as, again, large problem areas, the iPhone 14 is now being assembled in India. Going back to the digitization of India opportunities, it's going to offer up some really interesting manufacturing related value chain and stack advantages to B2B marketplaces coming out of India. And then last but not least, internally, we call this Bharat versus India opportunities. So India is, let's say, the top 30 to 50 million users who are a lot like American users. They watch Netflix and they wear the same sneakers and they go to the same movies and they speak in English primarily and their social graces are very similar to the West. And then there's the next 500 million Indians who are coming online where they're very different, but they're bounded in a very common way. So opportunities that go after the next 500 million Indians are, again, very large native unicorn opportunities. Go a little bit deeper into the Bharat versus India comparison. So for folks listening, Bharat also means India in Hindi. And so it's an interesting framing of the comparison. Why use the Hindi word for India versus the English word for India? I think that speaks to the comparison of those two segments. Yeah, as you rightly said, Bharat is the Hindi word for India, which denotes this new Indian consumer who's coming online. Many of them are educated, but many of them are not. They're using new native ways of consuming content on the internet, communicating. One of my colleagues made this observation that everywhere in the world, it takes about two years after someone comes online for them to buy stuff. There's like hundreds of millions of consumers somewhere in that two-year cycle where they're all going to become commerce subscribers as the trust they have in the internet gets higher and there's better pricing, more sachet pricing, as opposed to buying the whole bottle, which you see the other offline parts of Indian retail. As those innovations are in place, they're going to move into various commerce-like behaviors as opposed to just content and networking behaviors. One thing that we observed is their first tendency is not to download the fourth app that gives them sneakers. Unlike the top 30 million consumers who tend to want the premium selection, their focus is things like, I'm a farmer. Is there technologies that can help me do better farming? Or let's say it's a 20-some-year-old son of an insurance agent. They're like, look, I don't want to be an insurance agent, but are there employment opportunities that the internet can give me? We know from the US that Gen Z believes in the ability to make a living online. So that behavior exists in India as well. But since they come from a small town, they're worried about also economic opportunities. So you're actually seeing this manifest in a lot of creator economy ideas in India, but from the second to fourth tier towns, because there's a lot of talent and these creators want to use their creativity and ability to create content to actually make a living 
off the internet. So you're going to see some of the same Gen Z behaviors that we see globally around making a living on the internet, but you're going to see also some very India-specific behaviors, particularly around vernacular languages. And when you're evaluating these companies more in the Bharat category as opposed to the India category, are there different characteristics or different vectors that you look for? One of the things you see a lot of in the West, funding ideas that are very X for Y, because there's an established business model or established frame of reference. The headline stats, when you look at India from the West, are large population, large addressable market. The reality when you actually go underneath the surface is for the tier two or tier three part of India, truly the Bharat part of India, there's a lot of headline numbers, but the challenge is actually in monetization. A lot of these business models anchor on growth. They have great growth metrics but they can never quite convert that growth into monetization. I'm curious when you look at companies targeted for India versus companies targeted for Bharat, what are the different types of characteristics? What's the chronology of building an ideal type of company in those segments? How do you think about that? One of the things that we talk about is that we invest fairly sector agnostic. We sometimes say it's from climate to crypto and everything in between. So I'll probably use one example on those two extremes because it manifests itself so differently along those two extremes and everything in between. On the climate side, we think about a large contributor to GDP. So for example, if you can go make tomatoes at market prices throughout the year, that actually makes the market much bigger. So there it's way more deterministic where the market is extremely large and we're taking technology risk. On the other side, if you look at crypto, for example, we talk about a lot of new creators coming online. I think it's now possible to take a company that has attention economy like product and monetize it through commerce-like monetization models through NFTs and crypto. You obviously have seasons where they go up or down, but we're investors in a Web3 company called Stan, which has taken esports gamers from tier two to tier four towns and allowed them to connect with their fans. So a lot of these are 19 to 21 year old gamers who couldn't make a living off of this, but now they're in these tournaments, both offline as well as with Stan online, and they're able to sell NFTs that would have utility value, both in the online and offline world. It creates an engagement model for fans and their celebrity idols, in this case, in esports. But many of the fans, as well as celebs, are both not in tier one towns necessarily. And they don't necessarily use English terminologies when they are playing those games like PUBG and Free Fire and so on. It's actually manifesting itself quite differently across these various areas. But I agree with you. Still about 30 million families and households drive a lot of the transactional value. So the discipline around which stage you get into the companies that focus on Bharat is going to be very, very important. We have thought about also meaningful ownership because I think that a lot of these companies, once they hit product market fit, there is alternative ways of raising money in non-dilutive ways. For example, agriculture is a priority sector lending segment in India. So it's possible to get everything from bank loans to very low interest rate, working capital, and so on. There's all sorts of innovative ways to get alternative source of capital to grow in some of these Bharat-focused opportunities. I want to double-click a little bit into talent and culture with you. To cover the surface area of India First opportunities, you need a lot of things. You need capital, you need infrastructure, but first and foremost, you need talent. And we've talked a little bit about the talent and the energy bottoms up that's building for India today. From my perspective as an Indian American outside in, I've observed two seismic shifts, and I want to get your perspective on both of them. So the first idea is this idea of risk. There's this trope in the US and certainly in US tech, and it's starting to shift, but it's still there, that Indians are good employees, but are not good leaders. And a lot of that I actually think roots back to this idea of risk, and are you risk-seeking or are you risk-averse? The pendulum has certainly swung in the Indian ecosystem towards risk-seeking. Maybe you can react to that statement, especially having lived in India and here in different phases. I'm curious if that resonates or not. I think there's some truth to how long it has taken. Back in the 80s, when folks like K.B. Chandrasekhar and Akhanwal Reiki all took companies public before they went through different kind of outcomes. It took a while for the first Indian American CEOs to emerge. In India, there is a faster path, I think, because there's no need for cultural acclimatization for them in India. This is their home country, and they're very familiar operating in the country. They're very familiar hiring. They're very familiar building culture and teams inside and so on. The time that it takes for leaders to come into their own 
that Indian Americans took to come into their own in the US versus in India is probably going to be a lot faster because of that simple reason. The other thing that's happening that was not lost on people is a friend of mine who's a professor at a computer science department at one of the IITs said, let's say there are 50 students graduating from the class. Previously, 45 would move to the US literally a couple of weeks after graduating and very few would come back. And now it's probably close to the opposite where five move to the US and they're moving for very specific technical programs. And even they're thinking about coming back after they're done and maybe teaching and researching in India. And the other 45 are either joining a startup or starting a company. A lot of them are getting into this growth phase. They're becoming keenly aware of that. And through their alumni networks and connecting with the earlier generation of successful founders, they're learning all the mistakes that didn't work for the previous generation. Now, there's two generations of successful founders and all the management team members who are starting to come out of these successful companies. So for the first time, there's that same magic that made places like Silicon Valley work in the 80s and 90s and so on, where the folks that helped make Yahoo successful would go to Google. And then the folks who made Google successful would go to Facebook. And the folks who make Facebook successful go to Uber or Airbnb. So that's starting to happen in India as well, where once a product achieves a certain product market fit and certain scale, you can attract talent who've seen the movie before for their specific area of contribution. And typically the reason why 45 out of 50, especially from a place like IIT would be coming to the US, would be because of, I imagine, this underlying belief that opportunity is not capped in the US versus opportunity potentially being capped in India. The seismic shift and going in the inverse direction, to me, speaks to the fact that 45 of those 50 students are now thinking that opportunity is completely unbridled and not capped in India. Yeah, that's right. Previously, it was sort of a trade-off. Imagine if you were in your early 20s, you had to give up your family and your cultural upbringing and all that to move to a new country. But the trade-off was that it was in search of better opportunities. Now, I think it's not a trade-off at all where you can pursue all of those opportunities and the same kind of capital like chases you as a founder in India, but you're also grounded in your cultural upbringing and it's not really a trade-off. It starts to become a no-brainer for a lot of young engineers and founders. There's another phrase that's been used to describe India, which I think irks people in the ecosystem. It's calling India the developing world. There's more accurate language, but probably more importantly, better framework to think through the Indian ecosystem is something like the ascending world. I'm pointing this out because I think actually language matters in this case. Thinking about India as the developing world, especially for folks in the West, I think actually inaccurately frames what's going on. It doesn't open your mind to the larger subset of what's actually going on on the ground. And interestingly, when you double click into elements in India, especially things like UPI, et cetera, they're actually significantly more advanced than in the quote unquote developed world. It's funny that you say that. I think it's also a mindset, right? It's a fixed mindset versus growth mindset, where the fixed mindset is that you have parts of the world that are developed and parts of the world that are developing, and that's your only lens. I really like the ascending, descending view. Or one funny way that, again, one of my colleagues reframed this is that it's the developed world and then the developer world, reflective of where the energy is going. Even if you take newer areas like crypto, the number of developers out of India that are contributing to key projects. And one thing that I wanted to also talk about is that in this India for the world meme, right now, it's just software companies. Our belief is that there'll be some world beating Web3 companies that will also get created out of India. If you look at the developer energy, they're showing up in all of these areas, whether it's purely infrastructure projects or Web3 projects, et cetera. Visually, if you think of the next Sundar, the next Satya, the next Shantanu, and so on, they're all going to be building their businesses out of India. It's a no-brainer that the capital is chasing those founders because you know the differential value creation that has happened because of those leaders in the U.S. How would you compare both the ecosystems today? I mean, we often talk about how the rest of the world can learn from Silicon Valley and what it can learn from the U.S. What can the U.S. ecosystem learn from India? The biggest one is just looking at these N of one India opportunities that are still in early stages, but will start to become global companies. There's early indications of that. Baiju's, for example, has been growing a lot in the U.S., but really started out as an Indian teacher wanting to build quality content that's digital first and sold directly to the student. There's some good examples of these native unicorns that start to be seen as global companies. We saw this happening with Chinese companies that became global companies. We have a lot of Australian companies, for example, both in B2C and B2B. 
I think this meme of software companies that are built by incredible founders who see the flattening that the internet has done to take advantage of unique opportunities, I think we're going to see more and more of that happen. One thing that we're also seeing is founders get past the cultural trade-offs that we talked about. So they build the first few years of their companies in India, but then some of them move over here in year four, year five, increasingly more like year two, year three, to build the company as a US company. But their teams are still in India, which is very different from the unit that they were monetizing before was that they would personally move as a student or whatnot, and it was just them. But in this case, they're actually moving here as the CEO of a fairly successful company, but their entire team is still taking advantage of talent in India. And they're actually straddling both worlds. And it's been some really fascinating journeys and stories of founders, both their personal and professional journeys who are straddling both countries, but maybe slightly later in their lives. What does the rest of the world not understand about India? I think the top level narrative is pretty well understood. Large addressable market, young demographic, geopolitically obviously aligns with the US more than a China or so. But what are some of the non-obvious insights that describe the Indian ecosystem? And maybe we can take both sides of the coin, the bullish and optimistic case, we can take the pessimistic and bearish case. So maybe let's start with the bullish case or bullish insights. What are the non-obvious insights that describe the Indian ecosystem? I would keep this at the highest level. At the macro level, India is probably one of the few economies that is poised to just keep growing until 2050 or so. India will soon, if not already, be the fifth largest economy in the world, but that's still around 4 trillion GDP. And in 2026, 27, it'll become the fourth largest economy beating Germany. And based on where it gets ahead of Japan, India will somewhere be in the 25 to 28 trillion economy by 2050. That's the highest level message that folks should take the market very seriously. This is largely also driven by manufacturing, which is going to create its own set of opportunities. We talked about that, where, for example, large, very well-known successful products like the iPhone 14 are now assembled in India. Really interesting leading indicator for this local sustainability of manufacturing and many other industries. But on top of that, there are a lot of tailwinds. Folks may know that 65% of India's population is under 35 years old, which is insane when you think about the founder energy and the creator energy and just energy of young people. But also, India has about 700 million connected folks. And we talked about how they're reliably connected at this point and scrolled to 900 million devices. So it's probably going to be one of the largest internet populations globally soon, if not already. We talked about both the government encouraging and the markets supporting all the startup activity. So India now has about 73,000 active companies, and it's the second largest startup ecosystem. Even if you assume the same percentage of companies win, the denominator is just so high, and you're seeing all these young people. So all these are tailwinds that feed off of each other. And then the last thing I'll say is, of course, there are over 100 unicorns from India now. What's really exciting is the maturing of the public markets and the exit markets. Still pretty early, but there were seven or eight IPOs in the last couple of years where they started to offer some liquidity, which was actually the biggest moments of pause for a lot of investors. Is it wasn't clear how that cycle worked, both the M&A as well as the IPO cycle. And that's starting to also happen. The India stock market, for example, is the seventh largest stock market globally. And increasingly, there's an appetite for the public market investor to consume a lot of Indian software companies. These are all tailwinds that build on the top level path to becoming the third largest economy and beyond. And what about the flip side of that question? What about the bearish insights, the challenges? What does the world not understand about the challenges of building in India? I would put all of the challenges under ease of doing business. I would still say doing a startup in India is not for the faint hearted. There's no linear path. There's no linear path in startups, period. But there's an added element of non-linearity and non-deterministic paths if you're building in India. You asked me about talent earlier. One of the things is, even though India has a lot of incredible raw IQ and raw hustle, there's still this pause when it comes to people pursuing excellence and people honing their craft. For example, when I was at Stanford, when I just moved to Palo Alto, you could talk to someone who spent their entire lifetime hacking various websites. That's the only thing that they do. And their craft is really, really good on that one topic of endpoint security. And if you want to know everything that's going on and what the latest and greatest and the bleeding edges and that one very narrow topic, you'd know who to go talk to. I think in India, we're still seeing a lot of generalists. 
it's not rewarded as much to be 99% good at something versus 91% good at something. So as that happens, what my hope is, is that there's just more excellence in the ecosystem as opposed to this, we're just going to figure it out as we go mindset in a lot of new skill sets. Keep in mind that there's still a lot of zero to one build out. Like we talked about the plumbing and sewage versus curtains and drapes kind of problems. So when I was at Snapdeal, for example, in the US, we would have FedEx and UPS. But back when we were building Snapdeal, we had to build the equivalent of FedEx and UPS within India. There's still a lot of zero to one stuff. And so if you don't even know how to do the zero to one, it's hard to figure out how to do it efficiently. There's still going to be some amount of generalism in terms of building zero to one capabilities. There certainly has to be a lot more honing of craft, honing of skills, pursuit of excellence, point players who are really, really good at specific skill sets and so on. So that's the biggest thing I see as the leading indicator of what could slow down progress is that there just aren't these excellent top tier among the best businesses in the world built out of India. There's just a lot of people doing the 80-20 of going after big spaces, but it's not like an incredibly well-run business that's taking advantage of the opportunity. As a final question on in this, we round out, if everything went to plan in India, meaning the bull case fully played out, how do you think about the country? What does the country look like over the next few decades? How do you think about the country's technology ecosystem? And I'm equally interested in the inverse of that question. If everything did not go to plan and it didn't pan out, in your opinion, what would have gone wrong? This is similar to how I evaluate founders, which is, I think there's a lot of potential in the ecosystem. And it's really about achieving that potential and living out how amazing that potential could be if it actually manifests itself. Whether you look at the impact of these companies on the GDP, the number of high quality jobs created, even some of these products and platforms appealing to the aspirational nature of hundreds of millions of Indians who can get to a different strata by simply wanting to be better and using technology products and so on. The downside of it is that if you were really honest and if you had private conversations, there are still a lot of companies whose private valuations are far ahead of their revenues and where their businesses are at. And 2021, we saw a lot of that happen. Whereas in the public markets, we're seeing a lot of these companies with elevated valuations when they get to the public markets, they're really right-sized. And it's actually quite painful when that happens because public market investors often pay the price of buying up at the IPO. That'll probably be one of the areas where we see a lot of rationalization as there are more well-known comps around how to evaluate companies, especially where there's no parallel globally. There's just language around that. The other thing that I actually think is very important is there still has to be a lot of support in the early stage of product building. Even today, if there are two founders who want to build a world-class product in any industry, the number of investors that they could go have a deep conversation about technology and product and truly operating the business versus just raising the next round or operator versus investor conversations. And so internally, we say it's believers versus early stage capital, and it is investors versus builders who are helping you. There's still a huge dearth of both builders who are investors, as well as investors who are believers in the businesses. We certainly want to hold what we do to that very high bar of we're not early stage capital, we want to be believers. One reason we operate as a single firm is because we actually feel like we want to bring the compounded learning of all these companies that we've been lucky to be on the journeys of to help this next amazing founder that we see out of India. Our goal is not to find the best Indian companies. Our goal is to find the best companies, period, increasingly a large percentage of which are starting to become created out of India. That only happens when you bring your overall approach of excellence along with your approach of excellence in the best founders in India. You're probably seeing this theme emerge of approach of excellence versus mediocrity. That's my biggest concern. It's a standard concern when you're achieving your full potential that unless you're excellent, you don't really bring out your full potential. You bring out a mediocre amount, which is not really all that is possible. I really think the leading indicator is founders just having that high bar for excellence in whatever they build and investors having that high bar of what value they can add. Well, Anand, this is great. I really appreciate you taking the time. It's such a fascinating country and such a fascinating ecosystem with so many early strong signs and, of course, a litany of obstacles, but also opportunity in realization of that full potential. So this is a ton of fun. I really appreciate you coming on. Thank you, Romin. It's great that you're doing this series, man. I'm really excited to hear all of the other incredible conversations you're having. 
To keep learning about the topics discussed, head to joincolossus.com where you'll find our curated list of resources, a transcript for this episode, and a library of conversations on investing and business. That's J-O-I-N-C-O-L-O-S-S-U-S dot com.